Well, happy 4th of July, listeners of the good old days of radio show. Yes, it is July 4th, 2023, when this program is being released. And we're going to hear a program from July 4th, 1948. So we're going to go way back in time to the good old days of radio and listen to an episode of Escape called A Tooth for Paul Revere. Tooth for Paul Revere is a a fantasy play, but it does have a patriotic theme, and since it was broadcast on July 4th in 1948, and it's July 4th, 2023, um, we thought it would go a long ways to, to fill the spot as a tribute to July 4th here in the USA. The story is written by Stephen Vincent Benet, who also wrote the um, story for what became a very interesting film, The Devil and Daniel Webster. So if you're familiar with that, if you're not familiar with that, you should watch that movie. It's quite good. Um, great score by Bernard Herrmann, etc., etc. So here we go. Happy Fourth of July and a tooth for Paul Revere. Fed up with the everyday grind? Tired out from the summer heat. Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are spurring a lathered horse through darkened streets, trapped by two hostile armies with a kit of magic in your pocket and the American Revolution in the balance. Tonight, we escape to an earlier day and to the workshop of a famous wizard, as Stephen Vincent Benet told it in his delightful story, A Tooth for Paul Revere. Some say it all happened because of Hancock and Adams, and some put it back to the Stamp Act and before. Then there's some that hold out for Paul Revere and his little silver box. But the way I heard it, the American Revolution broke out because of Lige Butterwick and his tooth. My great aunt was a Butterwick, and I heard it from her. Every now and then she'd write it out and want to get it put in the history books, but they'd always put her off with some trifling sort of excuse. But the way she told it to us kids, sitting there before the flickering fire on some blustery, blowy night, it sounded spooky enough and wonderful enough to be... As true as the Union. History books, bah. You don't get the right of things from such. In the story of a nation, it's the queer corners that count. The tales that get whispered down through families. Now take Paul Revere, for instance. All most folks think about is his riding a horse. But he was a silversmith by trade. There was a kind of magic in that hand of his. I could see just a little bit farther into the millstone than most folks. And in that little shop of his on those fateful nights, he sat over a miraculous flame and brewed the revolution in a silver teapot. And then he put it into a little silver box. No bigger than this. Yes, that's the way my great aunt talked about Paul Revere, and the chills ran up our spines. But it takes all kinds to make a country, she used to say, and it isn't till the plain ones, like Lige Butterwick, get stirred up that things really start to happen. Lige was just an ordinary sort of man without special vision into a millstone. It might be a grand day in the history books, but for him it was just Tuesday, till he read about it in the papers. Folks could argue and fret about Boston tea parties and British warships in Boston Harbour and British soldiers in Boston streets. But Lige Butterwick just plucked his tongue and wondered how the corn might stand this year on his farm outside Lexington, Massachusetts. One day, Lige Butterwick woke up with a toothache. 
The hot salt pack and the tansy tea his wife fixed for him didn't seem to help much. On the third day, Mrs. Butterwick tied a string to the tooth and Lige stood by the door. You ready? Uh-huh. Uh. Well? Marthy, when it came to the pinch, I couldn't quite do it. So... That's how Lige Butterwick came to ride into Lexington, Massachusetts that day. He just had to see somebody about that tooth. And when he got there, the town was in an uproar. Lige! Lige Butterwick! Eh? Oh, good day to you, neighbor Williams. Lige, I didn't expect to see you here today. It's my tooth. Tooth? What do you mean? Uh, uh, hi, uh, hi. Huh? Oh, isn't it exciting? Exciting? A toothache? No, no, you idiot. All this. <laughs> Have you seen them yet? Seen who? Why, Hancock and Adams, of course. John Hancock and Sam Adams. They're at the Parson Clark's. Only folks who come here to see was the barber. Figure he's the only one who can do something for my tooth. Uh, <laughs> you don't fool me, Lige. You're probably just as excited as I am. Have you cleaned your musket? Musket? Why, it's five months, the hunting season yet. <laughs> That's where you're wrong, Lige. Looks like... Hunting season may be early this year. Huh? Keep your powder dry. Uh, huh? And so Lige Butterwick came to Lexington, and it was a great day for the history books, and to him it was just Tuesday. And his tooth was jumping, and he went to see the barber as the likeliest man he knew to pull a tooth. But the barber took one look at it and shook his head. Now, I can pull her out all right, Lige, but uh, she's got long roots and strong roots and she's going to leave an awful gap when she's gone. Hmm, that's true. Now, what you really need, though it's caustic my business, one of these here artificial teeth to go there in the hole. Artificial teeth? Yeah. Hey, uh, Land of mercy, it's flying in the face of nature. Nothing of the kind, Lige. Artificial teeth is all the go these days. Like to ought to keep up with the times. But... I, it would do me no good to see you with an artificial tooth. Yes, indeed it would. It would do you good, but, uh, supposing I did want one, how in Tunket would I get it in Lexington? Now, you just leave that all to me. You'll have to go into Boston, but I know just the man. Here, if I can find his. Yeah. Yeah, had his prospectus here somewhere. Oh, oh, yes, here. See here? Uh-huh. This fellow uh, called Revere in Boston that fixes him, and they say he's a boss workman. Revere. Yes, now you just listen to this here. Whereas many persons were so unfortunate as to lose their foreteeth. Uh, that's you, Lige. Oh, yeah. Uh, to their great detriment, not only in looks, but in speaking, both in public and private. This is to inform all such that they can have them uh, replaced by artificial ones. I see. That will look as well as the natural and answer to the end of speaking to all intents. Hmm. Oh, yes, and then see, it goes on. Hip- oh, his name, yes, his name's right here. Uh, Paul Revere Goldsmith, near the head of Dr. Clark's Wharf in Boston. Hmm. Sounds well enough, but... What's it going to cost? Oh, I, I know Revere. Comes through here pretty often, as a matter of fact. Does? Yes, and he's a decent fella, even if he is a pretty big bug and sounds liberty. Now, you just mentioned my name. Well, it's something I hadn't thought of, but mm. in for a penny, in for a pound. Mm. Mr. Day's work already, and that tooth's got to come out before I go stark staring mad. But what sort of man is this Revere, anyway? Oh, he's a regular wizard. A regular wizard with his tools. Wizard? Hmm. I don't know about wizards, but if he can fix my tooth, I'll call him one. So, Lige Butterwick got back on his horse and started for Boston. He rode through the busy, excited streets of Lexington, and when he came opposite the residence of Parson Clark, he saw a little crowd collected, men staring, so he stopped his horse for a moment and looked. Mister, is that them? Is it who, son? Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams, sir. There, through the window. Tall, handsome man and the short man with a face like a bulldog. Hmm, I wouldn't know, son. They're strangers to me. Get up. When he got to Boston, he began to feel queer. And it wasn't only his tooth. He hadn't been there for four years, and he'd expected to find it changed, but it wasn't that either. The sky was clear and beautiful, but... Lige felt like there was thunder in the air. It was uncanny. And the people, there'd be little knots of them on the corners, but when you came up to them, they seemed to melt away. 
or they'd look at you and stop talking. And then he came to the harbor. Out there in the port of Boston, riding black and grim for the British warships. He'd known they'd be there, of course, but it was different somehow, seeing them with their guns pointed in at the town. Suddenly felt uncomfortable. Felt he'd, he'd like to turn and go home. But he was hungry, and so he went to a tavern for a bite. <coughs> uh, good day to you. And what may I do for you, stranger? Uh... It's just a bite and a sup, if you're serving. I have a seat. You'll be served. Thank you. Uh, nice weather we're having these days. It's bitter weather for Boston. Uh, well, now, now maybe for Boston, but out in the country, we'd call it good planting weather. I guess maybe I was mistaken in you. It is good planting weather. For some kind of trees. Uh, trees. Well, now, I suppose you're right about that. That's so. Uh, and what kind of trees would you be thinking of? There's trees and trees, you know. Uh, well, uh, now that you ask you me, You meant I... the liberty tree. And may it soon be watered in the blood of tyrants. Now, the royal oak of England and God save King George and loyalty! At him, boys! Wait, wait, stop. I didn't mean... <laughs> Glory. I always heard city folks were crazy. But politics must be getting serious in these American colonies when they start fighting about trees. Oh. Aye, and it is, friend. So they threw you out, too? Yes, blast them. But I want to shake your hand. Nobly done, friend. And I'm glad to find another true-hearted man loyal to the crown in this pestilent, rebellious city. Well, I don't know as I quite agree with you about that. But I came here to get my tooth fixed, not to talk about politics. And as long as you've spoken so pleasant, I wonder if you could help me out. You see, I'm from Lexington Way, and I'm uh, looking for a fellow named Paul Revere. Paul Revere? No, so it's Paul Revere you want, my worthy and ingenious friend from the country. Well, I'll tell you how to find him. Good, I thank you. You go up to the first British soldier you see and ask the way, but... Uh, You'd better give the password first. Password? Yes, you say to that British soldier, any lobsters for sale today? And then you ask about Revere. Uh, but uh, why do I talk about lobsters first? Well, you see, the British soldiers wear red coats, so they like being asked about lobsters. Ah. Just try it and see. <laughs> Just try it, my friend, and see. Hup, hup, hee, ho! Uh, pardon me, sir. Uh, do you have any lobsters for sale today? What? How dare you seize that man? <sighs> uh, barrel. Place to hide. <sighs> Down that way. Come on, Sergeant. Huh? You can come out now. They've gone past. Oh. Oh, yes, thank you. Nice. Uh, Look at your clothes. That was a tar barrel you jumped into. Yes, I'm a sight. What were they chasing you for? I really don't know. Guess I didn't give the right password. Password? Yes, but all the same, I don't think soldiers ought to act like that when you ask them a civil question. But city folks are soldiers. They can't make a fool out of me. I came here to get my tooth fixed and get it fixed at will if I have to surprise the whole British kingdom to do it. Well, good for you, sir. Uh, can I be of any help to you? Ah, you can, boy. Uh, tell me where I may find the silversmith, Paul Revere. Oh, that's easy. Right before your eyes. There's a sign hanging down by the wharf, and that's his shop. I work there. Well, now, those soldiers did me a good turn after all. Come on, boy, now maybe I'll get my tooth fixed. Then Lige Butterwick was in the shop of Paul Revere, silversmith, goldsmith, jack of all trades, sculpturer of artificial teeth, brewer of revolutions, wizard. The shop itself was small and dark, 
with mysterious shadows lurking in the corners and the back. It was crammed full of the wondrous products of its owner's skillful hand, gold and silver objects of great beauty, prints of Boston and caricatures of the British, odd boxes and bottles filling the shelves. At this particular moment, it was also full of customers, and Lige Butterwick, with the cautious shyness of the countryman, sank back into a corner seat out of the way and watched as Paul Revere waited on several customers. And the last of these was a grand lady who looked like a, an irate turkey goblin. Oh, Master Revere, I am so disappointed. When I took the things from the box, I could just have cried. It's I who am disappointed, madam. What was the trouble? Must have been carelessly packed. Was it badly dented? No. I'll speak to the boy. No, no, it wasn't dented. But I wanted a really impressive silver service, something I can use when the, the governor comes to dine with us. I certainly paid for the best. And what have you given me? I've given you the best work of which I'm capable, madam. It was in my hands for six months, and I think they're capable hands. Oh, I know you are a, a competent artisan, Master uh, Revere, but... Silversmith, ma'am, Well, I don't care please. what you call it. I know I wanted a real service, something I could show my friends. And what have you given me? Oh, it's silver if you choose, but it's just as plain as a picket fence. <laughs> Simple, plain. You pay me high compliments, madam. Mm, compliments indeed. I'll send it back tomorrow. Why, there isn't as much as a lion or a unicorn on the cream jug. And I told you I wanted the sugar bowl covered with silver grapes. But you've given me something as bare as the hills of New England. And I won't stand it, I tell you. I'll send to London instead. Send away, madam. We're making new things in this country. New men. New silver. Perhaps who knows a new nation. <sighs> Plain, simple, bare as the hills and rocks of New England. Graceful as the boughs of elm trees. If my silver were only like that indeed. But that's what I wished to make it. As for you, madam, with your lions and unicorns and grape leaves and your nonsense of bad ornamentation done by bad silversmiths, your imported bad taste and your imported British manners, puff what? away with you. Puff, puff, puff. Why, why, I never. Puff, I say. William? Yes, sir. <laughs> Put up the shutters. We are closing for the day. Uh, oh, William, no word yet from Dr. Warren? Not yet, sir. <clears throat> yeah, what's that? Well, who are you there in the corner? Well, Mr. Vare. It is Mr. Vare, isn't it? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, it's a kind of a long story, but uh, closing or not, you got to listen to me. The barber told me so. The barber? You see, I'm Lige Butterwick, and it's my tooth. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll. Tooth, huh? <laughs> you'd, uh, you'd better begin at the beginning. Uh, oh, but wait now. Here, you don't talk like a Boston man. Where'd you come from? Oh, around Lexington Way. And you Lexington? See, uh, were you there this morning? Well, of course I was. That's where the barber I Never told Never mind about the barber. Were Miss Hancock and Mr. Adams still at Parson Clark's? Well, uh, they might have been, for all I know. But I couldn't say. Great heaven, is there a man in the American colonies who don't know Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams? Oh, well, there seems to be me. But uh, speaking of strangers, there was two of them staying at the parsonage when I rode past. One was a handsome man. The other man uh, looked more like a bulldog. So they are still there. And the British ready to march. Did you see many soldiers as you came to my shop, Mr. Butterwick? See them. They chased me into a tar barrel. Was a whole parcel of them by the common with guns and flags. Looked as if they meant business. Thank you, Mr. Berwick. You're a shrewd observer. You've done me and the colonies an invaluable service. Oh, that's nice to know. But uh, speaking of this tooth... <laughs> You're a stubborn man, Mr. Berwick. All the better. I like stubborn men. I wish we had more of them. Well, one good turn deserves another. You've helped me... I'll do my best for you. I've made artificial teeth, but drawing them is hardly my trade. All the same, let's have a look. Here, come over here by the light. Aye. And now, open. Ah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Butterwick, it appears to be compound agglutinated infraction of the upper molar. Oh. And I'm afraid I can't do anything about it tonight. Uh, but... But, uh... 
here's a draft that will ease the pain for a while. There. Drink. <clears throat> it's um it's spicy and uh and queer. <laughs> Never mind. Now you go to a tavern, get a night's rest. Come back see me in the morning. I'll find a truth drawer for you. If I'm here. Oh yes, sir. You'd best have some liniment. Uh, it's a queer kind of shop you have here, Mr. Revere. <laughs> some folks think so. Say, uh, what's in that little bottle? Where? Oh, there. That's a little chemical experiment of mine. I call it Essence of Boston. But there's a good deal of the east wind in it. Essence of Boston? Well, they did say you was a wizard. It's... Genuine magic, I suppose. Genuine magic, of course. And here. Here's the box with your liniment. It, no, no. Not that one. This one. Ah, thank you. Uh, but that other little box there, the little silver one with the stars on it and the elm tree. Oh, yes. You like it? Pick it up. Yeah. Mighty pretty work. Thank you. My own design. Thirteen stars there. See them? Uh-huh. You could make a very pretty design with stars. For a new country, say. If you wanted to. I've sometimes thought of it. But, um, uh, wh what's in the box? It feels queer. What's in it? What's in the air around us? Gunpowder? War? Making of a new nation? But the time isn't right yet. Not quite ripe. You mean that this here revolution that folks keep talking about? Yes. In this box? Glory be. Master Revere, it's come, it's come. The message from Dr. Warren. William, my riding boots. Now hurry, I must be off. Sorry, Mr. Butterwick, but I must rush. Take your liniment and come back tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Yes, thank you, I, sir. If I'm back thank tomorrow, you, I'll help you. Yes, Good day, sir. Good day. It wasn't till Lige Butterwick was alone in his room at the tavern where he was to stay the night that he realized what he had done. In the bustle and haste of leaving Mr. Revere's shop, he had picked up the wrong box. Instead of the box of liniment, he held in his hand the little silver box with the thirteen stars upon it. He hadn't quite believed Mr. Revere when he talked about the box. But then, everything had seemed so almighty queer since he'd arrived in Boston. And his tooth ached, and his head felt light. And he, being human, was curious. He looked for a keyhole. But there was none. The box wouldn't open. He shook it. Suddenly, it felt warm. As if there were was something alive inside it. He held it to his ear. Great Godfrey. Now, Lige Butterwick was feeling scared. But he was feeling kind of good, too. And then he found out that he was talking to himself. Well, I'm not a Britisher. I'm a New Englander. And maybe there's something beyond that. Something people like Hancock and Adams know about. And if it has to come with a revolution, well, I guess it has to come. Can't stay British as forever here in this country. But what am I going to do with this box? Too big a job for one man. Guess I'll have to take this back to Paul Revere. <laughs> First, he went to the little shop on Clark's Wharf, but it was closed up tight. And it was a while before he could rouse anyone. Then it was the boy, William, who opened the door. Oh, it's you. Well, Master Revere isn't here. But I've got to find him. Can you tell me where he's gone? Why do you want to know? Got something for him. He needs it. You wouldn't be a spy for the British now, would you? A spy? Me? Well, 
And what is it you got for him? This box. Little silver box. Took it by mistake. Think it's important. The box? By the flag, it isn't potent. But he's gone. Gone to warn the Patriots that the British are coming. Uh, which way, boy? Which way did he go? Uh, across the river. Uh, to Charlestown. All right, thank you, boy. I'll be following. <laughs> No, you don't get any boats from me. There was a crazy man long here an hour ago, and he wanted a boat, too. My husband was crazy enough to take him. And then do you know what he did? No, ma'am. He made my husband take my best petticoat to muffle the oars so they wouldn't splash when they passed that Britisher ship. My best petticoat, mind you. Huh. When my husband comes back, he's going to get a piece of my mind. Uh, was his name Paul Revere? Was he a man of 40-eyed, keen-looking, kind of Frenchy? Don't know what his right name is, but his name's Mud with me. My best petticoat tore into strips and swimming in that nasty river. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'll get a boat elsewhere. Mr. Butterwick, sir, be careful. Your own is right under the stern of a British man of war. Don't worry, I see it. Please, Mr. Butterwick, shh. Oi, there! Do, Mr. Uh, I else? guess not. Thought I had a boat. Be careful, Mr. Butterwick. All right, boy. Revere, he's been gone an hour. Gone? Gone where? Riding to Lexington to warn Hancock and Adams as soon as he spied the lights up there in the North Church. I've got to catch him. It's this box. He's got to have it. Where can I get a horse? Right over here. Come on. Out through the darkened streets of Charlestown, he rode, on into the black of the countryside. Once he got lost, but he found his way again and rode on. It was just dawn as he came inside of Lexington, and the dew was glistening on the green of the April grass. But Lige Butterwick didn't notice the beauty of the dawn. The little silver box was hot now and burning in his pocket. And then suddenly he reined in his horse. For there on the road were two men carrying a trunk, and one of them was Paul Revere. Well, Mr. Vare, say I'm on time for that little appointment about my tooth. Well, um, <laughs> ain't you? <laughs> you are a stubborn man, Mr. Budwick. I'll, uh, but uh, you give me a merry chase all night. I've had one myself. Been captured by the British once and escaped. Don't know what's still in store for me, but we're carrying a precious cargo here in this trunk. We're bringing to safety all the private papers of Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams. Uh, which reminds me, I've uh, something for you here. Silver box. You've got the silver box. I uh, by mistake, and it's getting frightfully hot in my hand. Yes, my friend, and little wonder. Look across there, Lexington Green. The green? Wh Why, there's a line of Lexington men. And there across the creek, facing them, is a column of British redcoats. Aye, lined up with guns, they are, Mr. Butterwick. They've come to arrest Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams, and the minute men stand before them. Mr. Vare? I'm a peaceable man. I've had little notion of politics. But I don't like what I saw in Boston. I don't like soldiers chasing peaceable citizens into tar barrels or uppity ladies with imported British manners. And I don't like British redcoats on Lexington Green. That I don't. Mr. Bedwick, what are you doing? I'm stamping on your silver box, Mr. Revere. I'm breaking it open. Do you know what you've done? You've let out the American Revolution. Look, they've fired the first shots. Well, I guess it's about time. And I guess I'd better be going now. Uh, but, Mr. Butterwick, where are you going? Home. Got a musket on the wall there. I'll be needing it. Uh, but here, what about your tooth? Oh, a tooth's just a tooth. But a country's a country. Anyhow, doesn't ache anymore. <laughs> Escape, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Tonight brought to you A Tooth for Paul Revere by Stephen Vincent Benet. Adapted for radio by John Dunkel and featuring Harry Bartell as Lige Butterwick, Parley Bear as Paul Revere, and Barry Kroger as the narrator. Special music by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, you are deep in a fabulous cavern in the mountain, surrounded by a horde of angry natives from a lost world held at the mercy of the most beautiful woman in the world, 
the terrible queen called She. Next week, we escape with H. Ryder Haggard's famous story, She. Good night, then, until the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Well, it's not CBS where 99 million people get... 99 million? (laughs) Interesting number there. They don't get 99 million listeners or viewers for their TV shows these days. I'm not even sure they get 9 million. (laughs) My, how the mighty have fallen. But it's not just CBS. It's all the networks. Uh, They don't... If they can get 2 or 3 million people watching one of their shows, I think that's (laughs) considered a top 10 show these days. Back in the good old days of radio, you would have 30 million people listening to a show. Anyway, um, that is our uh, tribute to the 4th of July from the good old days of radio show, A Tooth for Paul Revere, an episode of Escape from July 4th, 1948, with a great cast of great radio character actors there. Parley Bear, Harry Bartell, Gerald Moore. So, interesting. All right, back and re- back to regular programming next week and we will um, have our Thursday shows as well with the more unusual programs so until then this is John Tefteller saying thank you for listening goodbye